Bibles tonight to turn in them, please, to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. So much to say tonight. You know, I had this, I had this dream of coming for uh, our last time preaching here before leaving, and we were going to have this, you know, that moment, you know, that everybody expects, you know, it was going to be the, the big goodbye moment, you know, it was going to be this wonderful, I'm so thankful message, and it was going to be, you know, I was going to slowly walk out and cut the lights out on the way out and kind of look back, kind of like, you know, uh, remorsefully and sad, and it was going to be this big idea, and God ruined all that for me, uh, because I, I had a message that was planned for tonight, and I was really excited about it. It was in Isaiah chapter 59, and it's, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And boy, that was going to be a good message, and I was really excited about it. Yeah. And uh, last night, about 11 o'clock, I was looking over it again, and I was making some last-minute modifications. And uh, the whole thing, I, I, I cut a verse out, and I pasted it into my document, and the whole thing deleted and then closed really quick and saved. And all of it was gone. And I spent a long time trying to recover that and could not find it anywhere, you know, and it was gone. And so the Lord just had something different uh, on, that he wanted me to preach. And so I started looking at some texts and some things that I wanted to preach before. And I had, uh, I had this text, this text in the book of Daniel, chapter number 5. And uh, I wanted to preach that, but I wanted to preach it a certain way. It was kind of a fun text. And it had kind of an element of it, like a, you may think that you know Belshazzar, but you don't really know Belshazzar. You know what I mean? And I was like, that'd be great because Jordan always teases me about trying to, you know, flip the script on, on a Bible character. And so I was going to do that, and I was like, this would be fun. Lord, this is the text. Let's do it. You know, um, but uh, then I got to preparing the message, and I started working on it. And I started praying like you should do before you get to this point in getting ready for a message. Um, and uh, I said, God, will you make this what you want me to preach? And this is the message. And this is not the first message I wanted to preach. It's not even the second one that I thought I was going to preach. It's not even what I wanted to say to you. Um, and it's not going to be what you want to hear from me. Um, but uh, I have no doubt that it's what the Bible says. I have no doubt that the Bible teaches it clearly. And I know now that uh, the Lord has ordered the steps to this point. And so, Daniel chapter 5 I'm so unprepared. You guys forgive me. And another thing you're not supposed to do is say that you're unprepared when you're unprepared because sometimes people don't know that you are. So Daniel chapter 5, what we're going to do is we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Then we'll read verses 22 through the end of the chapter. Verses 1 through 9, the Bible says this, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake, and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled and his countenance was changed in him. And his lords were astonished. And so then the queen tells him about Daniel, Daniel, Daniel whose name was changed to Belteshazzar, and uh, tells him about Daniel. And so he calls Daniel to him. And in verse number 22, this is what Daniel says to him. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, and have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver of, and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. 
and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways thou hast not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written, and this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsin. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Balthazar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Let's pray together. Lord God, you know that this was not my plan, Lord, but uh, whenever things are not in my control, uh, which is often or always, uh, Lord, then they're in yours. And I can be confident knowing that uh, the only person who could have messed this up, which is me, uh, didn't do it because it wasn't my plan. So, Lord, I trust you to do what I can't do, Lord. Everything that we are doing from here and forward, Lord, and, and looking backwards as well, has been and will be things that we can't do in our flesh, Lord. And any work that we could do in our flesh isn't worth doing. And any work that we can do in our flesh wasn't ever your work to begin with. So, Lord, we count on you to do it, Lord. We love you. We trust you. And I ask for your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> the life of Belshazzar. It's obviously marked by behaviors that we shouldn't replicate in our own lives. His actions are publicly condemned by God, and his judgment comes swiftly and completely. The writing on the wall, the writing is on the wall for this kind of man. That's the name of the message tonight is the writing is on the wall. The writing is on the wall. So there's much that we can learn if we'll go to God and take this writing and see what he has to say to us. And I'm going to give you a long introduction here. I want to tell you that uh, I am not going to just springboard from this text and make a bunch of unrelated points about it, okay? So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to thoroughly prove each point, and so I'm going to ask for your patience. And we're going we're to check different texts, and we're going to check context, and we're going to compare it to what we think it says together. And uh, we are going to agree by the end of it that this is what the Bible says about this. We're not going to just say, uh, judgment is coming, and here's the reasons why God's going to judge America. I'm not going to do that tonight. Okay, we're going, to, uh, we're going to look at the text together and examine each place and see, does the Bible really say these things? So I'm going to ask for your patience and your attention on this. Yeah. Look, take a look at number verse 1 where it says, It pleased Darius, that's wrong, wrong chapter, uh, verse 5, the Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousands. Show me a place where a group is gathered together drinking alcohol, and I'll show you a place where someone is about to make a stupid decision. That's right. Show me a group of people gathered together drinking alcohol, and I'll show you a place where men are blaspheming the name of God. Amen. And it's interesting that the Bible makes it clear that this reckless and blasphemous decision that Belshazzar makes takes place while the taste of the wine is fresh on his lips. I had no intention of even mentioning this tonight, but brother, I tell you what, it's listed five times in these first four verses that they were drinking wine. Five times. And do you know that there are actually miracles that Christ committed while he was here on earth that he performed that are left out of the Bible? Yeah. The Bible says that there, there would be too many volumes even to, to fill the world if all of them were captured. So if the Lord saw fit in his sovereignty to leave out miracles that Christ performed, but he still ordained that these words would be written five times in four verses right here when, it, when one of them would have sufficed. If all it was was a background information that they were there drinking wine, if that was all it was was to serve for that, then he would have just said it one time and not five. He could have had room for more miracles. But if the Lord saw fit that these things should be listed so many times in these verses, I think it's very important. It's not just a background piece of information. It's the central theme in these verses. And it has to be stated. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Amen. Deceived tricked, <coughs> fooled into making a stupid decision, a decision that you knew better than to make. You want to know one of the greatest condemnations that Daniel has for Belshazzar? He says, you knew better. Right. He says, you knew better. You knew all these things, and yet you made this decision. Well, let me tell you, you put a glass of wine in front of somebody, you let them drink with all of their friends, and they're going to start making decisions that were stupid that they knew better than to make. And something led him to make a decision that he knew better. He had been trained. The Bible doesn't make it unclear as to whether or not he had learned from Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was his father. Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of his life, he had a long road in learning who the Lord was. 
But by the end of his life, he said, only Daniel's God is the true God. Only Daniel's God can deliver after these fashions. And he proclaimed throughout all of the land. And so certainly Belshazzar, his son, knew those things. And the Bible says that he knew those things. And yet still here he is. He is praising the gods of gold and of silver and of wood and of iron. And I don't think it's presumptuous for us to say, for us to say that part of what led to his decision of doing something he knew better than to do was the fact that he tarried long with the wine before he made that decision. Yes, sir. Right. He is sitting there with his friends, and they are gathered around for the purpose of drinking wine together. And that is always a recipe for disaster. Yes, sir. When we read in verse number one, he made a great feast to a thousand of his lords. To a thousand of his lords, one thought comes to my mind, and that is, wow, that seems excessive. Excessive. And you know, it was excessive. He gets a thousand people together, and they set glasses in front of all of them, and they're drinking to their heart's content, and they're having this giant feast, and there's, there's, there's goblets, and there's platters, and everything's covered, and it was, it was characteristic of excess. That's exactly what it was. It was excess. That's how it was defined, was excessive. Look first at his behavior, what we are trying to not emulate in Belshazzar, so we don't see the writing is on the wall for us in these same areas. And look first at his excess. The word excess is listed four times in the Bible, and it's always associated with something that you don't want to have anything to do with. Right. The first time it's listed is in Matthew 23, 25. I'm going to give you a minute to turn there. I'm going to try to speed this along. I'm going to give you a minute to turn there. Matthew 23, 25, where it's assigned to the scribes and the Pharisees. It's interesting that the excess refers to their cup and their platter. And so it's, it, is a, it is a comparison, and he's talking about the outside being dirty while you uh, clean while the inside is dirty. But Jesus never made a parable out of nonsense. He always made a parable and compared two things that were related to each other. We talked about that with the giving back during missions conference. So he never had a, had a parable made out of nonsense, and so he's referring to them. This excess has to do with their cup and their platter, and that, the reason why is because the excess that was characteristic of the scribes and the Pharisees often had to do with their cup and their platter. It seems like a clear pairing to this event. He has a banquet of excess here in Daniel chapter 5. Tables filled with feastings and glasses filled with wine were in his excess. The second time the verse is, is here, and that's in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. We're going to spend much more time here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18. This is a famous verse, and it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So it's clear that excess is something that you don't want to be associated with. Excess is not a character trait that you want to mark, you, uh, mark your life, but the excess it's talking about here is the drinking of wine. Is it not? Yeah. Drinking of wine. And, and let's be careful with this verse. Because somebody right now is saying, well, look at it in context. It's talking about drunkenness. Let's do it. Let's look at it in context. But I challenge you, when you say let's look at something in context, that you really look at it in context. Right. Because don't just take a surface level context of this verse and say, well, it's talking about drunkenness and move on. If you want to look at something in context, dive into the Word of God and find out what the context of this verse actually is. Let's be smart here. You're right about one thing, and that's that we should look at the, this verse in context. Don't come to a surface level conclusion and then stop examining. If you're going to dive in, dive all the way in. Yes, sir. Let's start with what's obvious. If you want to examine wine in the Scriptures then there are easier verses to go to than this one. Yeah. Okay, so right now we are, uh, we're, I say we, my wife, is teaching our kids in homeschool, right? She's teaching them math, all right? And when you start teaching someone math, you start with very simple things, don't you? Yes, sir. Two plus two equals four. Everybody knows it, right? And there are things in math that they undoubtedly don't understand yet because they're more complicated. But them not understanding those things shouldn't shake their confidence in whether two plus two equals four or not. Okay, you may come to a verse after this message tonight, and I'm sure that you will. You'll think back on it and you say, well, man, Brother Chris, I don't remember uh, everything that you said, but I don't understand this verse. Hey, listen, don't let uh, the square root of pi, if there is such a thing, confuse you on the fact that 2 plus 2 still does equal 4. Look at the simpler verses. Look at the, the truths that are absolutely clear, the ones that you do understand, and build off of those, and don't let those things that you don't understand shake your faith in the things that you do understand. If something is plainly uh, uh, stated in the Scriptures, believe it, understand it, accept it, and then build everything off of that. Don't uh, reach for some gray area in a, in a clouded uh, text that you don't understand yet, that somebody else may understand better than you, and build your philosophy off of that. Build your th 
philosophy off the simplest things. And I think a good place to do that is in Proverbs chapter 20. Amen. Proverbs chapter 20, uh, verse 1 says this. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Any questions about wine from that verse? That is 2 plus 2 equals 4. Everyone can read that verse and understand what wine is. It is a mocker. Amen. It is dangerous. It is raging. It is deceitful. It is lying. It is a trickster. And the only reason why you think that it is not is because it is a trickster and you have been deceived by it. Right. Yeah. Wine is a mocker. Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 35. Proverbs 23, the Bible says this, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look at verse number 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. You know, I don't know everything, but I know they don't like snakes. Right. And you know why I don't like snakes? Because they bite. Right. And because it's unpleasant when they bite. So come to a verse like this and understand that wine is a snake and it bites. And, it is, and it's painful when it bites you. It says, At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes, look at this, these are the results of the wine. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. You know what? You're going to start seeing things and looking at things you shouldn't look at. Your heart is going to start longing for things it shouldn't long at. Your walls of your inhibitions of your sinful nature will be torn down. And you're going to start uttering perverse things out of your mouth that you would not have otherwise uttered. Verse 34 says, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. Or he is he that lieth upon the top of a mast. You're going to feel like you're walking on the sea. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again, it says. Oh, that's talking about drunkenness again, Brother Chris. Oh, is it? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at some very simple things in here. I'll tell you what. You want to get somebody's attention, put a jar of grape juice in front of the pulpit before you start preaching, because everybody wanted to know beforehand, hey, what are you going to do with that grape juice? You know what I mean? So if I'd have known that trick, I would have used it long ago to keep people glued in. So what I have here is Welch's grape. All right? Was not going to purchase real wine, obviously, but then I have a small glass. We're going to do some equal part testing here. And what is that? When does it say uh, uh, not to look upon the wine, Brother John? When it's red. Okay, so you guys tell me, we're doing a little experiment here. This is our wine. It's pure, it is undiluted. What color is it? Purple. Purple, okay, it's beyond red. All right, it is beyond red, okay? So that is one cup. That is one cup of our wine. You know what they used to do with it in the Bible times? They would dilute it down. You know why? Because they would use it to kill the, uh, the bacteria in the, in, the, in the water right there. They didn't have filters back there, back then. And so they would use a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of, of, of alcohol in something. And it was to kill the water. It was medicinal. It was to clear it out and things like that. It was not an alcoholic drink the way that we have it now. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later as we go on. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to add some water into it. What color is it? Purple. Purple still red, right? What color is it? Still purple, right? What color is it? Purple. You see where we're going here? What color is it? Purple. Somebody get me a towel. It's leaking. <laughs> it is purple. And Andy's going to kill me if that gets on the electrical. Amen. Amen. So what we're going to do here is for illustration purposes, boom, look at that. Don't look at the wine when it's red. I dare you not to look at it. This was a, I test, you know, I tested this beforehand. You know what I mean? Yay. All right. So we get the picture, right? So you would have to dilute it and dilute it and dilute it and dilute it again and again and again. And it would have taken, uh, I've done this before, it would have taken several of those pictures. It's still just as red as it started with. 
So the Bible is telling you, listen, don't look at that alcoholic drink. Don't even look at it. Don't drink it. And so we're wondering, well, is it about drunkenness? No, it's not about drunkenness. It's about wine altogether. Amen. Don't drink alcoholic drink is what it's telling you to do. Do not look upon that uh, when it is red still. It, when they, they would dilute it and they would dilute it and they would dilute it. Go ahead, Randy. Nobody's watching you. Go ahead. <laughs> Get it right there. Nobody's looking. It's not like there's a million people watching on Facebook or anything, right? Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's great. You're great. So, be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Who hath redness of the, of the eyes? They tarry long, tarry long at the wine. Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Okay, so if you want the context of a wine that was acceptable to drink in Bible times, it would have been diluted so far that it would not have had its color anymore. That could hardly have been called an alcoholic drink like we have today. Do you know what the average uh, alcohol by content is uh, in, a, in, a, in a glass of wine today? It's 15% or so. Okay, 15% alcohol by, that's about the max. So uh, back in Bible times, if they were going to ferment a drink, the very, very highest they could ferment it would have been to about 15%. That would have been the strongest drink in the, in the land, would have been something that would have been a glass of wine right then. So when we have birds in the Bible like, gla uh, like a wine and strong drink, and we know that they're two different things, we have in our minds this, this bottle of Jack Daniels that's a strong drink, right? That's not strong drink in the Bible. That, that wasn't even invented yet. That didn't even exist yet. The, the, the process of distilling alcohol did not even exist in Bible times. And so when it's talking about strong drink, it would have been talking about what you have in your hand when you've poured yourself a glass of wine. Okay, well, it's by today's standards, all right? So if you think that uh, uh, wine is wine and strong drink is something that you get at the ABC store, you're wrong. You are historically wrong because what you're holding at the ABC store did not even exist at that time. So the strongest thing at the time would have been the glass of wine that you hold in your hand when you're pouring yourself a glass of Merlot. That would have been the strong drink that the Bible always strictly forbids you to look at. And if you were going to drink anything with alcohol in it, all it was saying was, uh, kill, kill the bacteria in your water. When Paul told Timothy, uh, drink not only water, but add a little bit of wine to your diet, what he was saying was, hey, listen, P Timothy had given up wine so much that he was not even, not even killing the bacteria in his water anymore. He was saying, hey, listen, Timothy, I, I appreciate what you're doing here, but you got to add a little bit of alcohol in there to kill that, to kill that, uh, to kill that, to kill that bacteria in the, in the water. And he would have diluted it so much that you would not have been able to taste the wine, not be able to see the wine. He would have diluted it all the way until the wine was not even red anymore. Do not look at the wine when it is red. Why? Because it bites like a serpent. Amen. How many of you have sympathy for somebody who plays with snakes and then gets bit by a snake? I have no sympathy when I see somebody on television who has been playing with a snake and then gets bit by a snake. Okay? You have asked for that. You have asked for that trouble. You play with that animal and it bites you, then you have asked for that, okay? And when you, when you uh, pour a glass of wine in front of you, you say, all I'm doing is trying to relax. Hey, listen, what you're doing is you're snake handling. Right. We're Baptists. We're not snake handlers, amen? amen. But here, here we are. We're, we're handling a snake, and then we're wondering, oh, woe is me because it's bit me. Well, what do snakes do? Snakes bite. Right. So we see the obvious. We see that in Proverbs chapter 20, wine is a mocker, strong drink is weight raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. We see that at the last it bites like a serpent. We see that it causes your mind to be polluted, your body to be polluted. It causes you, you sickness and illness. We see that it leads to destruction. We see these things very clearly, and they cannot be disputed in Scripture. And, you know, I didn't have to go to the Greek to prove it to you. It's a, very, it's a very clear explanation. We didn't have to dissect words or things like that. You can read it in the good old King James Bible. You can read it for yourself, and you can find that it's the truth. Anybody who reads these verses differently is not looking for direction. They're looking for permission. And here's what I mean. I don't mean that you, act, that you actually are specifically personally desiring to do it, but you're asking the wrong question. When we go to read the Word of God, we shouldn't ask, can I do this? We shouldn't ask, uh, uh, can I find a loophole that allows me to do this? We, we should not even more so ask, we should not, where does the Bible forbid me to do this? Okay, what you're doing now is you're looking for permission. What we ought to ask is, does the Lord want me to do this? Right. Is the Lord pleased with my behavior? And if we ask ourselves, is the Lord pleased with this, the answer becomes much clearer. Now, truth doesn't change just because you ask the wrong question. Truth is truth. But you are skirting your way around the truth trying to find another answer that pleases you if you're trying to find one that says that drinking wine in moderation is okay. And we're going we're gonna to move on, and I'm not going to end early tonight. But forgive me. I told you I wasn't. It's my last time preaching here. You guys love me. Y'all will forgive me. Amen. <laughs> but now that we've set the context, 
Because that's what we said we wanted to do. We said we wanted the context, right, yes. of that verse. We wanted the context, okay? We can go back to Ephesians 5.18. And sticking with the philosophy of what is the most obvious portrayal of wine, what is the 2 plus 2 answer of this, what is the most obvious portrayal of it, even in Ephesians 5.18, we can see, is it portrayed as a positive thing or a negative thing, this drinking of wine? It's portrayed, very obviously, as a negative thing. Be ye not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And so the drinking of the wine itself is portrayed as a negative thing. Well, you could say that it's about drunkenness. Well, let's continue on. Why is it contrasted with being filled with the Spirit? Amen. Because being filled with the Spirit is a good thing, right? Right. Right. right? How about just a little bit of the Spirit? Is it still good? Yeah. Amen. It's the Spirit of God, isn't it? Yeah, right. So, so if, the, if we can see then that it's not about the quantity, it's about the character of the substance is what, what, what the verse is really about. It's not about the quantity that you take in there. It's saying, be not drunk with wine because wine is bad. Wherein is excess? It's not saying drunkenness is full of excess. It's saying that excess comes from the wine. It is going to lead you down the path of excess. Don't think that the drunkenness is talking about the excess. The wine leads to the excess. Right. And we know it's not the quantity because the Holy Spirit is good even if you just had a little bit of it. Right. All right, this, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't just become good when you're filled with it. So why would wine just become bad when you're drunk with it? Right. It's not about the quantity. It's a comparison between a good thing and a bad thing. The Holy Spirit is good all the time, amen? amen. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good, right? Okay, wine is bad yes, sir. all the time. Amen. A little bit of it, a lot of it, it is bad all the time. It's saying be filled with the Spirit because the Spirit is a good thing, and you should be filled with it. Amen. Don't be drunk with wine because wine is a bad thing, and you don't want to be filled with it. Amen. The second time that verse was used was in Ephesians 5.18. We see that the issue is not the quantity of the substance, it's the character of the substance. The third time it's used is in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 3. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 3. And imagine that. What do you think it's related to? Drinking of wine. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3, and then the fourth time is in verse number 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3 says this, For in time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So this verse sounds like it could be talking about that party that Belshazzar threw. Yeah, it says it very clearly. What is it? It's, it's, it's uh, walking in the will of the Gentiles. It's walking in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. What is he doing? He's sitting there drinking excess of wine. He's eating excess of food with his banquet that he's thrown, his giant feast. And they're uh, in idolatries because he's praising the idols and the gods of, of gold and of silver and of wood and of iron. So this sounds like it's talking about that verse. And its association there again is with wine. Because wine is not only bad in excess, but because it causes excess. It leads to excess. The excesses of wine. The problems caused by sin. It's the excess of wine. It's not saying that you drink wine in excess that's bad. It's saying that wine leads to that excess that you want to stay away from. That same excess that was written on the wall for Belshazzar. And we can be cute and we can be Bible lawyers if we want to and we try to find excuses to do things that we know in our hearts the Lord does not want us to do and not want us to touch. The writing is on the wall for such a man. Right. And their judgment is going to be condemned, and it's just be just as public as it was for Belshazzar. Verse number four, you can, and uh, the same text we can see is the fourth spot where it is listed, and it says this: "Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you." Okay, excess of riot. So let's let's examine the quantity argument again. Excess of riot. Is riot only bad in excess? Okay, so is the Bible saying now that you should have your riot in moderation? Is that what it's saying? Is it, is it saying riot responsibly? Is that the commercial right now that we're seeing right now, riot responsibly? Make sure you only light a few buildings on fire, right? Only flip a few cars over, okay? No, rioting is bad. 
That's why excess of rioting is bad, is because rioting itself is bad. Right. And so very clearly that the excess of wine is bad from the same context because the wine itself is bad. Right. Excess of the Spirit isn't bad, is it? No, sir. Amen. Be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Be not filled with wine. Right. Be not drunk with wine. So we have the problem here. It's not with the quantity of the riot. The problem is with the character of the riot. God is not okay with us having just a little riot any more than he is a little bit of wine. He's not okay with us having a little bit of wine any more than a little bit of rebellion or a little bit of riot or a little bit of witchcraft or a little bit of any of these other sins. He wants us to stay away from those things altogether. Yes. Excess of them is bad. Yes, it is. You know why? Because they're bad. Amen. And excess of bad things is bad. Amen. Therefore, they are bad. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Fill with the Spirit in this equation is no doubt the good thing, obviously. Two plus two. And the wine here is painted in a negative light. So be careful of any interpretation that leads you to any conclusion that wine is anything other than negative. One is good, one is bad. Do this, don't do that. The application here has nothing to do with moderation. It's not saying drink moderately. It's not saying drink responsibly. It's not saying riot moderately. It's saying stay away from it. It's bad. Well, what about Jesus turning water into wine? You know what, that is such an easy thing to clear up. And I don't need the Greek translation to do it. It's plain, it's in the English, in the, in the, in the King James Version of the Bible. You know what, let's turn to that. John chapter 2. I'm not going to assume that everybody remembers that. Everybody hasn't been studying it. John chapter 2. The wedding of Cana in Galilee. read those texts together. I'm going to start in verse number one. In the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, means they, were, they had run out, right? They wanted wine. They were lacking it. The mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. I love that verse. My mother hath... I'm going to Italy. I need that verse. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So these are very, very big. Okay, I've done the math before, I remember what it is now. But imagine giant 55-gallon drums of water here. They're huge, right? It would take them a very long time to fill up. They were very, very, very full. They were very, very large. They filled them to the brim, to the very, very top. He saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And you know what? The governor of the feast notices something about this wine in comparison to the other wine that they had. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the service which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Well, why did he do that? Well, he saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, than that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. You know what he recognized? He recognized this wine was different than the previous wine he had tasted. Amen. He recognized that the wine that came out at first was the best wine, no doubt. He said, but this wine, it tastes different. You know the first thing he noticed? He noticed it tastes better. Yeah. This wine tastes better than the other wine we had before now. It's in the text, right? This wine tastes better than the other wine. You know what? I, I don't care who you ask, Welch's grape tastes better than a cup of Merlot. Or, who, or whatever it is, okay? It's sweeter, it tastes better. Nobody likes the taste of wine, even people who drink wine. You probably have to take 100 a, a years to get acquired to the taste of wine. Uh, but uh, grape juice tastes better. So what he had uh, given him was something that tasted better. He noticed that this was not the same. This is very clearly not the same kind of wine that he had drank earlier, okay? You don't like my conclusion that it was grape juice? Fine, that's fine. But it was different. The master of the ceremonies, the governor of the feast, had noticed that this was a different kind of wine. Well, how was it different? When men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Well, the first wine would have gotten you drunk. What is commented here about the first wine is that it would have eventually desensitized them to where they were drunk enough to where they wouldn't have noticed how bad the, the second wine was. They said, give them the good stuff first. They'll drink it, and they'll taste buds. They'll get numb. Then you give them the second stuff afterwards. They won't realize it's bad wine. So the, what he pointed out was, hey, this first wine that, that, was, that was given out that would have been the kind that gets you drunk, this is a different kind than that. Somebody who would have drunk of that first wine possibly would have gotten intoxicated from it, not the second wine. There was something that was remarkably different about this wine. He turned it into a different kind of wine than what they had drunk before. 
And I say that the only thing that was different about it probably was that it tasted better and the fact that there's only one thing that was remarked about that first wine, that was its, its, its intoxicating effect. And he says, this wine is different than that wine, meaning that I don't believe that it had one. So he turned it into a type of wine which would have not been intoxicating. Maybe it was grape juice. Maybe it was water that was diluted with grape juice. I don't know what exactly it was, but it was not the kind of alcoholic wine that we so famously at our, at our gatherings want to throw around right now saying that it's okay for us to drink. It was not that kind of wine. And I can prove it again by this. The proposal by this argument is absurd. And let me show you, not just because we're Baptists, we know against drinking, okay? But uh, there, there are people, I guarantee you, in the congregation today who still think that it's okay to drink just a little bit of wine, regardless of the rioting stuff. But let me tell you this. If, if Jesus had turned that water into the kind of wine that you're thinking about, then this is what he would have done. Jesus would have taken a group of people that had drank every ounce of wine they had already. Enough wine they would have drank it already, which would have apparently, in normal circumstances, been enough wine to have caused them to be intoxicated, according to the governor of the feast, right? So this, this wedding, everyone had drank so much of it already, so much of it that was enough to get them intoxicated, and then Jesus comes and doubles it, and gives them more, so they're, they're half drunk already, and Jesus comes, and he gives them twice as much wine so they can further their drunkenness? Is that what we think? Is that the picture that we have of our Savior right now? That We know that drunkenness is wrong. Anybody who even doesn't believe the Bible knows that drunkenness is wrong. And you can find that very clearly in the Scriptures, that drunkenness is wrong. Be not drunk with wine. So what Jesus would have been doing for them would have been getting them drunk with wine. Because if they drank all the wine they had at first, which was enough to desensitize you, then he goes and doubles and gives them three more large pitchers of it and says, here guys, drink up. Now can we picture Jesus doing that with wine? Absolutely not. Taking it and giving it to drunk people. Absolutely not. Jesus would not have made wine and then given it to people who had been drinking wine already. It's ridiculous. So either Jesus aided them in their drunkenness, which all of us would reject, or, as the text seems to indicate, there was something different about this wine. It didn't lead to drunkenness. It tasted better. You know why it tasted better? Because it was better. It tasted different because it was different. It was a different kind of wine or a different kind that, that had been given to them before. And our Savior did not go and take a bunch of drunk people and then, and then just give them three more giant jugs to share among them. Good, brother. Preach it. Good. Notice his excess. And notice his ignorance. His ignorance. Verse 22 says in that original text, Daniel chapter 5, And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thy heart, though thou knewest all this. Well, guess what? Now all of you know all this. All of you know all this, and you have a decision to make. Am I going to humble my heart and accept it? Or am I going to reject it? Daniel told Belshazzar, you knew all of it. In the light of the great effort that it takes Daniel to record their drinking, it's impossible to ignore that their drinking contributed to their foolishness, his blasphemy, and eventually his calamity. You know that there were entire miracles that weren't recorded in the Scriptures, so if God decided to keep this in, then it's important. And I want to make sure, absolutely sure, to tell you that drinking alcohol is foolish and leads to foolish decisions and eventually to God's judgment. Amen. Belshazzar was ignorant. <coughs> ignorant doesn't necessarily mean he didn't know. It means he ignored it. He ignored it. He had the knowledge. He did know. He wasn't ignorant because he wasn't told. He was told, but he had it, and he ignored it, and he brushed it off. His ignorance. The root of ignorance isn't to be kept from knowledge. It's ignoring something that has been made plain to you. If you want to avoid excess, avoid wine. If you want to know the character of wine, look at what it leads to, drunkenness and excess. If you want to see the biblical perspective on wine, it is a mocker, a deceiver, a raging maniac. If you want to see the nature of wine, look at its supporters and its advocates. You know, sometimes wisdom dictates that if you look to your left side and your right side, it'll tell you whether you're on the wrong team or not. Because if you look to your left side and you see a drunkard, and you look to your right side and you see Budweiser, and you look to your front and you see Jack Daniels, and you're all marching the same line, and you look behind you and you see that swarming you behind you is every nightclub and every, every den of immorality that serves this alcohol and that, and that makes a living off of the profiting of people's lives and their families and their, and their futures. If you see that you are marching in the same direction as them on this, you're wrong. Right, yeah. You right. are wrong. You should be able to look at with wisdom and say, hey, wait a minute. They're not going towards the statutes in, 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 in direction of God. Right. And so if I'm marching alongside of them, then I'm headed in the wrong direction. Amen. 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 Right. Come on. 
If you can ignore all the scriptures, all the exhortations from the church, and all the evidence of broken homes, destroyed lives caused by the very proponents of your cause, well, then I got something to tell you. The writing is on the wall. The writing is in the scriptures. It's been put there by none other than the finger of God himself. If your portrayal of alcohol is anything other than a biting serpent, then it is a creation of your own mind. It's not reality. It's just as much of an idol as the gold and silver that were being worshipped by Belshazzar. It led to his ruin, and it will lead to yours. Yes, sir. Right, right. And that night, he was slain. He was slain, and he had been surrounded by literally a thousand people who were his friends, and none of them helped him. He had just thrown a fantastic festival for them all, but none would help him in the end. In the end, his sin did to him what it always does to everyone. It killed him. Yes, sir. Right. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Right. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. Lord, I don't know if uh, anyone was helped or if nobody was helped, Lord, but uh, I know that my heart was challenged to preach this, Lord. Maybe it was in preparation for uh, a nation uh, in Italy who was uh, very famous for their wine, Lord. But, um, Lord, I pray that someone was challenged, Lord. Yes. Um, Lord, I pray that if, if someone right now was deciding whether they're going to be on the decision of drinking a little wine or no wine, Lord, I pray that you'll that you'll get that serpent out of their house, Lord. I pray they won't keep that serpent as a pet any longer, Lord. I pray they won't handle it and allow themselves to be bitten, Lord. I pray when it bites their children, Lord, I pray that...